Please turn in your Bibles at this time to the book of 1 Timothy. And 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning with verse 14. This is on page 991, actually 992 in your pew Bibles. Paul writes here, as the Holy Spirit leads and directs him, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you, so that, if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. Let's bow forward to prayer. Father, we thank you for uh, speaking to us through your written word. Thank you for revealing to us things about uh, even what the church is, like in this passage before us this morning. We ask that as we hear your word and are reminded of what what the church is as you describe it through your servant Paul, that we more and more, by your Holy Spirit, live out what you say that we are. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a tremendous description of the church found in this passage in 1 Timothy, the pillar and buttress of the truth. Let me read an example of a church leader's stand for truth, proclaiming against not just an individual's rejection of it, but a society, a government's rejection of truth. He said this, How far are the divine commandments now obeyed in our community? The commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not lie. How often is is it shamelessly and publicly broken? The commandment, thou shalt not steal, whose possessions are now secure since the arbitrary and ruthless confiscation of the property of our brothers and sisters. The commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Think of the instructions and assurances on free sexual intercourse. And how much shameless and disreputable conduct of this kind we read about and observe and experience in our city. And now the commandment, thou shalt not kill, is set aside and broken under the eyes of the authorities whose function it should be to protect the rule of law and human life. He continues, And how do matters stand with the observance of the commandment which enjoins us to honor and obey our parents, And those in authority over us, the status and authority of parents is already much undermined and is increasingly shaken by all the obligations imposed on children against the will of their parents. You know when this was said and where it was said? Sunday, August 3rd, 1941. It was preached in 1941 in St. Lambert's Church, Munster, Germany. Now, not everyone will be familiar with that time frame. Adolf Hitler took power in Germany in 1933, so this was preached in Germany eight years into Hitler's rule. This was preached as Europe and Russia were involved in World War II, and the U.S. would enter World War II later in the same year that this message was preached. U.S. entered World War II December of 1941. This Christian leader went down the second table of the Ten Commandments and proclaimed how the government, the Nazi government, were breaking every one of these commandments in their laws, in their direction as government. How do you think they felt about this? Praise the Lord. I don't think the Nazis were saying that, but... I'm not sure he knew as he was proclaiming these things in 1941 about the Nazis' plans to murder the Jews, but he had become aware of, and this is what he was preaching about when he said of the government, that they were breaking the command, you shall not murder. 
He had become aware of, at that time, a, a Nazi program, basically a euthanasia plan. Uh, he said earlier in this message about the euthanasia plan where they would take mentally disabled people and put them to death. He said earlier in the message, if it is once admitted that men have the right to kill, quote, unproductive, unquote, fellow men, even though it is at present applied only to poor and defenseless mentally ill patients, then the way is open for the murder of all unproductive men and women, the incurably ill, the handicapped who are unable to work, those disabled in industry or war, the way is open indeed for the murder of all of us when we become old and infirm and therefore unproductive. Uh, one site notes about the Nazi government of this time uh, in this program. Meanwhile, beginning in the fall of 1939, Nazi officials selected around 70,000 Germans institutionalized for mental illness or physical disabilities to be gassed to death in the so-called euthanasia program. After prominent German religious leaders protested, Hitler put an end to the program in August of 1941, though killings of the disabled continued in secrecy. And by 1945, some 275,000 people deemed handicapped from all over Europe had been killed. In hindsight, it seems clear that the euthanasia program functioned as a pilot for the Holocaust. Little did this leader know when he preached this message that by the end of the Nazi regime, six million innocent Jews and others that the government determined were unproductive or useless or enemies of the state would be put to death through Nazi efforts throughout Europe. I don't know if you caught the date that this uh, article on the Holocaust from History.com gave, uh, let's see here, maybe I can get it, August of 1941. Do you remember when this message that I started with this morning, when that was preached? August 3rd, 1941. I didn't know until this week in studying for this passage, but it's, it's an amazing thing. As evil as Hitler was, as evil as the Nazis were, they put an end to this program, officially, of euthanizing uh, what they called useless people when the church protested. The Nazis did this. When the church protested, they put an end to a program. Of course, we... See, and this article brings out, they, they kept it going in secrecy. But they were ashamed to publicly admit doing this evil when the church stood up and proclaimed truth. What would have happened if every group claiming the name Church of the Living God in Germany would have been openly stating and proclaiming these kind of things? What would have happened if every group claiming the name Church of the Living God would have said, whether someone is Jewish or handicapped or old, whoever they might be, these are image bearers of God, and as such they are accorded treatment that fits with who they are. Not murder, because they're considered unproductive or worthless or unacceptable to live. In the passage before us this morning in 1 Timothy, God says through Paul that the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. That, that's a huge responsibility. What's that mean? And, and as the church the living God, how can we faithfully live out what we are? Uh, before we get further into the message, we don't faithfully live it out because it works. Uh, or because it makes things better in our society, although we, we sure hope it works, and we sure hope things will be better in our society, we faithfully seek to proclaim the truth because this is what we are as the church, the pillar and buttress of the truth. However truth might be received, however it might be rejected, in season, out of season, the church proclaims truth, period. 
In the passage we're in this morning, we ask and see answered, what is the church? Uh, in the New Testament, we see several descriptions of the church. We just finished the book of Ephesians, and in Ephesians alone, there's eight different descriptions of the church. Uh, but what is this passage? First Timothy 3, verse 15. What does this passage tell us the church is? Here, Paul gives us two descriptions of the church. And it's important to know so we can faithfully live out what we are. I don't know if you ever think uh, the local church is insignificant or unimportant. Uh, If you do, think again in light of God's description of the church found in this passage. First, the church is the household of God. Second, the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. If you're not already there, look down in your Bibles in 1 Timothy 3, verse 14. Again, this is on page 992 in the Pew Bibles. 1 Timothy 3, verse 14. Paul writes, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of of the truth. The first description of the church is the household of God. And and why we say this is a description of the church is right in the passage, Paul says, "Here's I, I want you to know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God. So this is his description of what the church is. The church is the household of God. Now, you're all smart, you all know the Bible, you might not need to rehear this, but I, I'm going to restate this just in case you've forgotten this. When you hear the word church, what comes to your mind? Uh, boy, you're good. Uh, you're, you're good. I, I hope everyone didn't hear that because I'm going to throw out a rhetorical question now. Is it the building? And Okay, good. Someone already answered it wasn't before I asked my rhetorical questions. So they are really, really good. No, in the New Testament, uh, church has nothing to do with building. Uh, That's not the meaning of it. And someone said what the meaning of the church is. The term church here comes from the Greek word ekklesia. And this term was literally used in the culture of Paul's day to describe people who had assembled together for any variety of reasons. Uh, We can see a... Uh, a usage of this term in Acts chapter 19, which doesn't describe the church of the living God, but the same term is used in Acts chapter 19 to describe how it was used in that society, an assembly. Uh, I won't have us turn here for the sake of time, but Acts chapter 19, verse 32. Paul is here in Ephesus, and uh, lots of crazy things are happening in Ephesus, and it says this. Now some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly... Ecclesia. It's not talking about good, it's not talking about the ecclesia of the living God here. Now, some cried out one thing, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. So there's this riot like thing forming in Ephesus, and this assembly had come together, and it's called the ecclesia, the assembly. And most of them did not know why they had come together. Verse 39. But if you seek anything further, this is the government official kind of rebuking them for gathering and rioting like they were here. He said, but if you seek anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. Ecclesia. Verse 40, for we really are in danger of being charged with rioting today, since there is no cause that we can give to justify this commotion. And when he had said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Ecclesia. Here in Acts chapter 19, again, we just see how this term was used in, in society in general. Uh, ecclesia is, and here in Acts 19, it's the assembly of the people convened at the public place for counsel or for the purpose of deliberating. There is a place where the ecclesia, where the assembly came to gather, this particular assembly. So what I want you to see first off is the literal idea of church is simply Assembly, the citizens, they came together. They assembled. Now, 
uh, this official is rebuking them, saying, well, it's almost like you're rioting here. Be careful. This isn't an official assembly. Why don't you come back with your complaints to the official assembly later? But the point is, that's the meaning of this term. Bible scholar Robert Sosi notes of the secular usage of this term, ecclesia. He said, the word came to stand for any assembly, regardless of its constituents or manner of convening, the broad use is evident even in the New Testament where a confused mob which had rushed into the theater at Ephesus is twice called an ecclesia, Acts 19, 32, and 41. And in the same context, the term is used for a lawful assembly, verse 39. In addition, in secular Greek, ecclesia refers only to the assembly or meeting and never to the people which compose that assembly. When the people are not assembled, they are not considered as composing an ecclesia. So just note two things based on this. First, the term ecclesia, this is the Greek word, almost always in the New Testament translated as church. It wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a religious term, if you're thinking that. It was the assembly, and it could be all kinds of different assemblies that this term was used for. Yeah, any assembly as Sosi brings out. That's why we see things like this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 1. Uh, as, as Paul begins that letter, he says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. The, the type of ecclesia had to be made clear as Paul is addressing them in this letter. Now, I'm not talking about any assembly. I'm talking about an assembly in Thessalon Thessalonica, and it's in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This is that assembly I'm talking about. This is that church I'm speaking of. Second, uh, and, and I take it this morning, this is very important for our recollection. The church is very tightly connected with this idea or assembly. It, it's, as you would imagine, it's very tightly connected with assembling. This is when the church is, when it, when it has assembled. Again, this idea was so prominent that Soci noted in the secular Greek, uh, it refers only to the assembly or meeting and never to the people which compose that assembly. When the people are not assembled, they are not considered as composing an ecclesia. Now, we're going to see in a moment how this meaning is, is broadened once the church takes hold of this and, and we're called the church, the assembly. But a key component of church, when we talk about church, think of assembly, assembly, assembly. That, that's at the heart of the meaning of this term. And I suppose in all ages, but especially in our day and age, I think that's important to remember. If, if, if you think, ah, I, I'm part of the universal church. I don't need to ever assemble together with other people of, of my local church. Well, you're, you're missing out on, on really the heart and sometimes people, for health reasons or whatever reasons, they can't, they can't make it. So that, that's granted. But, but the idea of church is assembling the assembly. So when the writers of the New Testament and Jesus took up this word, it's used in two interrelated senses. First, as Sosi brings out, it, it refers to a local assembly of all those who profess faith and allegiance to Christ. That, that's what a church is. That's the local church. It's an assembly of people professing faith and allegiance to Jesus Christ. The vast majority of times you see church used in the New Testament, it's referring to local church, specific local churches. Uh, I, I take it this is what Paul is referring to here even in 1 Timothy 3 verse 15 because of the context, he's just been talking about leadership in the local church. He's been talking about elders and deacons. And, and he also in this very verse has talked about, okay, I'm writing, writing these things so that you would know how to behave in the church. 
how one ought to behave in the church. He's, he's not talking about the universal church here. He's talking about a local church. Here's how you're to act. Here's how you behave. Here's how, how things are to happen in the local church. So I take it what he's referring to here with these descriptions is especially local churches, a local assembly of all those who profess faith and allegiance to Christ. Now, second, and, and this is more rare, uh, this term church, ecclesia, is used in a much broader sense. The universal church. In this usage, the concept of a physical assembly gives way to the spiritual unity of all believers in Christ. Ecclesia, in this sense, is not the assembly itself, but rather those constituting it. They are the church, whether actually assembled or not. So here's where it goes beyond that literal Greek meaning, where in the New Testament it does speak of the church broadly in this sense. Even when you're not assembled, uh, even connected with someone who uh, uh, goes to a church that believes in Jesus Christ in China or Cameroon or wherever it might be, we are, if, if they're a believer in Jesus Christ and they're part of a local assembly, we with them, we are the church, the universal church. Uh, this goes back to the day of Pentecost and this extends all the way until the rapture. All believers of all time in all these places they are the universal church. So that's just a reminder. But with this in mind of what the church is, look at look again at the first description that Paul gives. The church is the household of God. So number one, as it sounds like, it, it basically means that we are part of God's family. That, that's a great description of us as a church. That's a God-given description of, of a local church, the household of God. That makes sense since everyone who believes in Jesus Christ, they've been adopted into God's family. They've been adopted by God. He's now their father. We're his children. It's a tremendous thing to look at the church when it is assembled. And I like how Brad Cromer put it a few weeks back when he was teaching in Philippians on Sunday evening. Each week is like a family reunion. That's a good description. Uh, that's the household of God. Or, using this idea of the household of God, it's like uh, a family gathering at the supper table or something like that, or a get-together. And, and for a family reunion or, or a, a family meal or something like that, uh, it's not the same when the whole family isn't there. This, again, gets to that idea of the assembly. You know, we miss you. You're part of the family and you're not here. We want you to be here. We're missing someone. So that's important to remember, too, as part of the family. We want to see each other. We want to be with each other. We want to get together for our reunion every Sunday morning. Uh, that, that's, that's good to remember. But the term household here denotes more than just family. One Greek lexicon notes how this term was used in the Greek language of New Testament times. The household, uh, the Greek term for this, the family consisting of those related by blood and marriage as well as slaves and servants living in the same house or homestead, family or household. It's a household when this group is living in the same house or homestead. Uh, my parents used to live in Neely, Nebraska from 1985 to uh, also like 1997, something like that. And uh, at that time, during portions of that time, later during that time, one of my brothers and his wife lived in Arizona. My sister and her family lived in South Africa. My other brother and his family lived in South Dakota. Melody and I lived in Los Angeles. We were still a family. We'll continue to be a family. But at that point, we weren't part of my mom and dad's household because none of us were in the house anymore. So that's one thing to remember, too, with this idea of, of household. Well, so what as far as the church being described this way? Here, as Paul uses, it's a fairly common term to describe a local church. Household, definitely there's that sense of family, 
But there's also a sense that the Old Testament would speak of God's temple as God's house. Uh, 2 Chronicles 29, verse 16, this is just one of several examples where you hear, see God's house equated with God's temple. Uh, th- this is where God's presence was manifested in the world. There is a certain place where God's presence was manifested in the world. With the church as God's household, the assembly of those who profess faith and allegiance to Jesus Christ, this today is where God's presence is manifested in the world. I don't know if you think of the church that way. Bible scholar Thomas Constable puts it this way. He said, this metaphor served to elevate the community of believers as the location, quote unquote, of God's presence on earth. The church has become his base of operation in the world. Do you ever think of the church like this? You should. Paul says that the church is the household of God. A second description. The church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. Again, it's a description of the local church. I love this description. I, I think it's a very important reminder. Uh, let's be clear with this reminder what Paul is, is saying, what he's not saying. It's not saying that the church is the truth or that the church determines the truth. It says the church is the support the pillar and buttress of the truth. We remember Jesus Christ once said of himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So Jesus Christ, ultimately, he is the truth. Uh, Do you remember when Pilate, not many hours from when Jesus said this in John 14, in, in John 18, verse 38, when Pilate and Jesus were interacting And Pilate cynically asked Jesus, what is truth? Isn't that also that the question of today of so many people in our society? What is truth? There's no such thing as truth. Uh, I remember in one of my classes uh, at UNL many years ago, the teacher during a, a discussion time just asked us to define what is truth. And uh, I couldn't do it. I don't know if anyone in the class did it well, if anyone did it without him telling us. You know, truth is truth. You just know what it is. How can I define it? But if someone were to ask you how to define truth, uh, one of the, and especially in our day where there isn't even anything such as truth, it, it's important to at least be able to say what it is. The Hebrew term and the Greek term for truth, they they have the idea, truth is that which conforms to things as they really are. Truth is that which conforms to reality. Uh, Edward J. Carnell, we definitely wouldn't agree with everything that he says or wrote, but I take it he does have a helpful definition of truth also. He says, truth then, in its simplest dimension, is a judgment which corresponds to things as they actually are. If I say it's raining outside and experience shows that it is so, I am speaking the truth. This definition of truth, however, is deficient from the Christian point of view, for it does not link truth with the mind of God sharply enough. For the Christian, God is truth because he is the author of all facts and all meaning. He continues, There's no reality apart from the eternal nature of God himself and the universe which he has created to display his glory. Truth for the Christian, then, is defined as correspondence with the mind of God. On any level of judgment, therefore, man has truth only as long as he says about facts what God says about these facts. Uh, Jesus says of himself, I am the truth, I embody truth. Everything I say, everything I do, everything you see in me, it conforms to reality, it conforms to the mind of God because as John brings out the beginning of John, Jesus is the word. He's the ultimate revealer of God. But we also see Jesus say this about God's written word. He says, 
uh, in John 17, verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. So this is truth. Jesus embodies it in the Bible. God's word conveys it to us. If you want to know what the mind of God is, we find it in the written word of God, the scriptures, as he reveals this to us. He doesn't reveal everything about himself, but if you want to know about truth and you want to know reality, we find it in this book, the Bible. Now with that in mind, the church is the pillar and support of the truth. One scholar notes that truth in itself is self-evident and self-sustained. It needs no external support or foundation. But truth as it is manifested to the world needs the best support and the firmest basis that can be found for it. And it is the duty and privilege of the church to supply these God's household is not only a community which in a solemn and special way belongs to the living God, it is also the pillar and ground of the truth. Out of any people, out of any religion, out of any organization, out of any organism, out of any business, out of any government, whatever you can think of, only the church is the household of God. And only the church is the pillar and support of the truth as a pillar, lifts up and supports the truth and uh, uh, the roof, and as a buttress supports or gives stability to a wall or a building, so the church lifts up, supports, defends, gives a sure ground for truth in this world. We proclaim it. We defend it against error. No matter if it's well received or not, again, in season, out of season, it's still tr- if it's true, if it's here in the Bible, we proclaim it. This is just what the church is, the pillar and buttress, the pillar and support of the truth. So week after week in Bible studies and fellowship groups and various classes and, uh, and Sunday after Sunday in our assembling together as a body, we proclaim him who is the truth, Jesus Christ, We proclaim that which he called truth, the word of God, the Bible. When we think about living this out in the world, as the church is the pillar and support and the buttress of the truth, one quote puts this really well, uh, how we apply, apply this. This quote is attributed to Martin Luther, but as scholars have researched his, all his writings, they, they can't find this quote anywhere there. So probably he never said this. But whoever said it, even though it's attributed to Martin Luther, whoever says it is still really good. Here's the quote. If I profess with the loudest voice and clearest exposition every portion of the truth of God, except precisely that little point, which the world and the devil are at that moment attacking, I am not confessing Christ, however boldly I may be professing Christ. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. And to be steady in all the battlefields besides is merely flight and disgrace if he flinches at that point. That's good. Today, the battle rages in basic areas that the Bible says are true. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he who is the truth, said once in Matthew 19, 14, he answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? That's not old-fashioned. That's not ignorant. This is true, and we'll proclaim it. When President Biden in the State of the Union address says, if you, if you, the American people, send me a Congress that supports the right to choose, I promise you I'll restore Roe versus Wade as the law of the land again. I promise you. When the New York Attorney General put on a press release in 2022 after Roe versus Wade was overthrown, stating how New York guarantees access to abortion care, she said this, quote, 
New York guarantees the unqualified right to abortion up to 24 weeks post-fertilization. Abortion is permitted after 24 weeks if the fetus is not viable or if the pregnant person's life or health, including mental health, that's, that's part of her quote, uh, including mental health is at risk. In New York, minors may responsibly access abortion or other reproductive health services without parental notification or consent. So when, when we hear these kind of things from government officials, we proclaim life begins at conception. Amen. I've preached whole messages on this. And we stand for the protection of innocent life. The basic statement of the Bible protecting innocent life is found in the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. You can't take innocent life, young or old, unproductive or productive, doesn't matter the race, you can't take innocent life. Governments are not exempt from that truth. Governments are instituted to protect life, innocent life. As a church, we'll proclaim the whole counsel of God truth, especially in those areas where the battle rages, because the church is the pillar and support of the truth. We're not under the Mosaic Covenant, but there are certain truths found there that relate to the very nature of God, who he is. And so they're unchanging whatever covenant is spoken of in Scripture, Old Testament, New Testament, whatever, it's always wrong. Certain things are always wrong because they always go against the very nature of God. Theologians call this the moral law of God. It's always going to be wrong to dishonor father and mother. It's always going to be wrong to murder. It's always going to be wrong to steal it's always going to be wrong to commit adultery. It's always going to be wrong to bear false witness. It's always going to be wrong to covet. These are all repeated in the New Testament, these truths. So when governments begin to establish laws and policies that directly contradict God's moral law, when God says, you shall not murder, you shall not take innocent life, and the government laws say, yes, we'll make sure that you can, then, as the pillar and support of the truth, we'll stand up and proclaim truth against error. And as the church is not just the preacher, but the church is the assembly, and since God has blessed us in the United States with the privilege of voting for those who will be representing us, you should be looking for candidates and party platforms and looking them over and, and trying to think, well, Maybe I like their policies in some things, uh, but are, are they endorsing in their platforms and the laws they're talking about, are they endorsing what God forbids? Is that what they're pushing for as laws, what God forbids? What God says, do not, do they directly seek to pass laws saying, do? Do they directly support that which goes against the truth of God's moral law? then as the pillar in support of the truth, we want to support it when it's under attack and vote against who attacks it and vote for someone who doesn't go directly against God's moral law. There's probably always going to be disagreements about how best to love other people. And that's, there's room for disagreements, how that could be instituted, how laws might reflect that, whatever. But when God says... And the truth says, do not. And then laws are passed saying, do. There's no doubt that this is contrary to the truth. So again, look at party platforms. Go to sites that tell of candidates' positions on these issues. Uh, in Nebraska, there's something called the Voter Information Project. You can look that up and see. Uh, there's the Nebraska Family Council I think they have a lot of good material addressing these kind of things. And maybe you think, well, what, what good does it even do? Well, we could have a whole message just on that. But the bottom line is, we as the assembly, as the church, we are the pillar and support of the truth. And I take it one very practical element is that we stand up for the truth when someone is going directly against it, 
or when someone is standing up for it in our society, we want to support them. We want to say, yes, this is truth, and they're for it, and I'm for them. We want to be for truth, period. We support it. We defend it. We proclaim it whenever it might be under attack. That Martin Luther quote again, I love. Again, he probably didn't even say it. Where the battle rages, there the loyalty of the soldier is proved. Uh, that's, that's the question for us to say. Where does the battle rage? Where does the battle rage? Okay, well, let's, let's speak truth in those areas. As individuals, we know that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God in many different ways. And if you think about it and if you get to the heart of the commandments, probably we have violated every one of the Ten Commandments ourselves. That's why we thank God for forgiveness of sins. Whatever they were, whatever they are, because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose again from the dead, he paid for all of our sins so we can be forgiven of them and have justification, being declared righteous by a holy God. So there's forgiveness, and we thank the Lord for that. There's full and complete forgiveness for whatever ways we've broken God's standard. There's forgiveness because what Jesus has done. So this morning as we close this time off, the heart of the truth is Jesus Christ. And the heart of the message that the church proclaims is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the good news is Christ died for your sins and rose again for the dead. And you can be forgiven and you can have eternal life. Whatever commandments you've broken, uh, whatever you've done in your past, you can be forgiven when you trust in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. So if you've never done so, Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ this morning. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. It's light. What we've seen this morning, it's truth. And we thank you for what you have described your church, the church of the living God, as. Church is the pillar and buttress, the pillar and support of the truth. Help us as a local church. We, we know we fail even as a church and we fail mightily. But by your spirit, help us as best we can to be what we are, to be what you say that we are, to live it out practically as a local church. Help us through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.